Body looks good. I want to, um, it's second Sunday of the month, which is a missions moment Sunday for us. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about what we've done locally and around the world. That's just accountability for us. And the Bible says to go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? That's, that's the great commission. If you don't know what that is, that's what Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28. And so we're a missions oriented church. I love uh, Pastor Andy who did a phenomenal job for us last week. He's uh, taking a team to Uganda uh, later uh, next month. And um, I just want to share with you about what God is doing um, and what we've done. Uh, our most recent church uh, effort is was in Buenos Aires, which uh, someone that born and raised here, grew up there, is uh, grew up here, is down there building church. But we helped a lot of church plant pastors get trained and equipped. They're going to go all through that nation planting churches, and um, we directly financially supported that. And so I just want to thank you for helping to spread the gospel. You can see some of the pastors in the background getting ready to be commissioned to go and plant churches in that country. Come on, can we give it up for Jesus? We hear a lot of bad stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff happening too. I love it. In addition to that, um, our Hope Cares, which is what connects everything that we do outreach-wise in our community. Um, one branch of that, uh, ministers to first responders. This month, we went to all four of our police precincts and served them, connected with them, brought them things, blessed them, gave them a bunch of treats, and um, let them know about our police lounge that we're opening up, first responders lounge, firefighters. Everybody has access to this building. We'll have access 24-7 to a room where they can kind of take a load off, get equipped, um, do their paperwork, things like that. We opened that at our Midlothian campus we have about 25 first responders that use that regularly every week, and um, I think it'll be um, massive here. So we're about to launch that, and I just want to thank you. If you serve our community, we got a spot for you. And if you give here, serve here, pray here, then that is something that you're directly involved in. And I don't know about you, but um, I think our first responders need all the help, love, and support that they can get. So can we... Uh, can we give it up for all those guys? I know there's some in our church here today. There'll be a spot for you, and uh, we give them a code, and they can just come at midnight and grab an energy bar and do some paperwork and sit in the couch and talk and go back out and do it. So thankful for you, church. It's just one of the ways we're serving our community. You know, when you show the love of Jesus, uh, they'll love you back. And uh, I just happen to believe that that's one of the greatest communications of the gospel is love. Would you agree with that? Serving our community in love. Eight of you want to do that. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, come on. Don't you think that spreading the gospel, let me hear you, through love is one of the best things you can do. So good. Um, today's special. Uh, not just because it's Sunday. Uh, I've been uh, on staff here for almost 22 years, and today, this Sunday, 10 years ago this Sunday, uh, my beautiful wife and I uh, were with my mom and dad, and uh, we took uh, the lead of Hope Point Church. So this is our 10th year, just celebrated 10 years leading the church. I want to thank God for that. He's been incredibly faithful. Oh, thank you. You didn't... That wasn't the point, but I appreciate it. Hey, maybe, maybe better. Let's do this. Maybe better. Let's give it up for Jesus. Can we do that? Come on. All things are possible with him. We couldn't do any of this without him. You know it. I know it. We know it. When I look at what God has done in 10 years' time, it's been pretty incredible, hasn't it? I just look around at all the new people, people that have connected to Christ, and I can honestly say, it's the best part. People meeting Jesus, you finding your purpose and your destiny in Him. And so, uh, I'm going to move on before I get um, messed up. But just want to say we love you. If you're joining us online, welcome to Hope Point. If you're a guest with us today, it's an honor to have you. 
and for the rest of our church family, man, it's good to see you. No, seriously, it's good to see you in God's house, doing it right, growing in Him and in His grace. God's got something good for you today. Do you know you have a good and heavenly Father who always gives good gifts? He's never given a bad gift. He doesn't re-gift. He doesn't give bad gifts. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You pull that card. I don't know who needs a Bayberry candle. Let's just, okay. But he gives good gifts. And today, um, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that, and you know God's done a lot in my life. I would never talk about this topic the first 10 years of my ministry. But um, I'm going to talk with you about rest. I'm going to talk with you about rest. And um, if you would, I want you to bow your heads. I want this to get in your spirit more than your head. I can. Holy Spirit, today we honor you. Not only because of who you are, but because of what you do each and every day in our lives. And this is your church. And I pray that in this service today, you would do something that we can't, that intellect can't. We don't, we don't need to just grasp this with our mind. We need to get it in our spirit. And so I want to ask you to come and do what I can. Build your church. Transform our lives. Change us. Plant your word in us. We give you this time. We thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. Uh, open heaven service tonight. You should not miss that service. It's going to be bonkers good. And I just want to say that. I love that service presence of God comes in miraculous ways and you need that service look at your neighbor say you need that service you didn't believe what you said but you do I want to I want to um thank Pastor Andy he filled in for me last week he did a phenomenal job can we give it up for him I don't know it might be in our second service today but uh what a what a phenomenal job uh lived the gospel um, today I want to talk with you about rest uh, this the title of this message is called rest with the best and as I was uh, on vacation this past week, I felt like the Lord gave me four words for this message. And um, uh, the, the four words are uh, connection, connection, conformity, conformity, commitment, commitment, and contentment, contentment. And I think those are four key words to finding rest, connection to God, conformity to his word, commitment to him, and contentment with what he's called you to. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this today, and I thought I'd start by confessing, because a lot of times I think people look at me up here, and I just want you to know I'm, I'm just someone like you and privileged to, um, that God has called me to do this. But um, I felt like I should confess some things. And, and confession is good for us. We're, we're, we've, we've lost the art of confession, I think, in a lot of ways. But confession is good. The Bible talks about confession. So I'm going to confess some things about rest. Because um, in, I've been married to my beautiful wife for 22 years. And um, she's told me that I don't do this at all. Rest that I'm very bad at it. Would you agree? I'm glad I'm preaching this message, not you, because I don't want you to say too much. <laughs> but um, uh, I don't really ever rest. And um, not really. Uh, and I used to think, um, some of the things that I need to confess, um, I used to think of rest, I would always have this connotation with it as weakness. I felt like... Um, Working, to me, has always been a joy. Uh, and I felt like really hard work always seemed to pay off. And I saw it in, and, and it does. I saw it in family. I saw it in uh, marriage. I saw it in, in, in ministry. God builds the church 100%, but I just felt like, oh, man, if I just work hard, do whatever. Um, I felt like if I needed to rest, that maybe I simply wasn't strong enough. Does anybody deal with that? Is that just me? Okay, a few of you. It's good. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not alone. I used to think of rest uh, as doing nothing and being unproductive. And I hated that. I hated that. And my dad uh, is the, still the hardest working person I know. And he's retired. 
I'm like, Dad, you really need to stop. He's like, oh, I ain't stopping. I'm gonna, if you stop, you die. <laughs> That's not true. I mean, if you stop breathing, you'll die, but, you know. But, but anyway, uh, I, I had that as a model, and, and my dad is amazing at a lot of things. That isn't one of them. This is probably a generational curse. <laughs> But rest, I always thought, was a characteristic of people that maybe, uh, that, that for me, if I was resting, I was lazy or couldn't cut it. It just felt that way. Uh, my staff ha- has all kind of names that they would describe me as, like a machine. And I used to think that was good. Seriously. I thought, well, machines, you know, they get it done, you know. Um, and I thought like I could always soothe my conscience, right, and act like work was a holy thing and that skipping rest was okay because I was, uh, quote-unquote, working for the Lord. Just, these are some of my confessions. They might not be yours, but I felt like maybe uh, I should do this because I don't ever want to f- seem hypocritical. So if I'm going to talk about rest, I need to, like, get over some hurdles. There are people that work far harder than me, and it bothers me because I'm competitive, and I don't like to rest. And so I felt like I was floating in the Gulf of Mexico, and Amy was probably praying that a shark wouldn't eat me because she's scared to death of the ocean. And I felt the Lord talk to me about this topic And I thought, well, you know, maybe this is good. I'm going to try and focus on this because I tried to actually do some rest, but I would never rest on vacation. I worked. I did messages. I did other things. I talked to people, did all the things. I loved it, loved it, and felt like, okay, my vacation was productive. (laughs) That's just how I'm wired. The word rest, just from a biblical perspective, it means, the word would be Shabbat, right? It's Sabbath. And where we get that is what? On the seventh day, which would be Saturday for the Hebrews, God rested. He finished his work, so he rested. So I always thought I could use that. Well, that's because he finished his work, right? Just telling you some of the things that go through my mind. But Genesis 2, 2 through 3 says, by the seventh day, when he had finished his work and all he had been doing, he rested from it. And God blessed the seventh day. God will bless you when he rests you. And he made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work he created that he had done. And here's what I felt like. In this service today, I felt like God wanted to set some people free. That There's people here today that are just on edge. Like just... Uh, not ever at peace. You've got a lot of things going on in your life and that God wants to unburden you from that. Resting is not doing nothing and it's not being unproductive, trust me. I'm gonna flip the script on this for a minute. In fact, I think when you're rested, you can do more for God than anything else. But, I, but, but, but on the seventh day, he rested so it's holy. And then God codified that in the Ten Commandments, right? Which is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. This is rest for us, actually. The coming to God's house and being in his presence is rest. And if you don't see it as that, then, you have to, then we need to work on your definition. Because resting is not, you know, sitting by a pool with a Mai Tai doing nothing. Resting is being in God's presence with his people. It's part of rest. I want you to get this for a minute. A lot of people, the Lord told me, are trying to self-soothe and they're not resting, they're covering. So we self-soothe in a lot of ways with different things that actually never provide rest or peace. And what they do is reinforce a cycle of not resting. Because you did them, and then you don't have any fruit, and then later you're still worn out, weary. Right? Are you with me? So I want, what I want to do is I want to give you a biblical perspective on this, because I actually believe through the Holy Spirit that God wants to set you free today. And, and Jesus gives rest, which I think is really important. Uh, Jesus gives it. If, if you need rest, look no further than him. 
Here's what Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says. This is an invitation from Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, and burdened, and I will give you rest. So rest is a gift from Jesus to you. Come on, all my workaholics. Receive it. Take my yoke. Now, this seems very different. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But I want to frame this because Jesus seems to be talking about two very contradictory things here, doesn't he? He's talking about rest and in the exact same breath talking about yokes and burdens. One of these things is not like the other. Why would Jesus be talking about rest and then yokes and burdens? Because not only does Jesus give it, but God never intended you to live without a weight. Don't confuse rest with a lack of weight. Rest is not a lack of weight. Rest is being content in the weight that a heavenly father places upon a son and a daughter. Not a weight of the world. The world will wear you out. You can pick up things that you were never meant to carry. But a weight that God gives. I want you to hear this. This is so important. I think it'll set some people. You'll look at this verse differently. There is a weight and God didn't intend for you not to live with it. Even to Adam in a, perf in a perfect state. He said, tend the garden and extend it. There was always a weight to his rest. Are you with me? You can't actually learn without trusting Christ and taking on the weight. That's why he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That learning from Jesus comes after you accept the weight that he wants to give you. You will never truly learn if you don't get in the game. Are you with me? That, that when you take his yoke, his calling, his presence, his, 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 his anointing on your life, that that is actually where you begin to learn and process because it's an application of the word that he wrote that he called you to. So you can't actually find rest without the yoke of the lordship of Jesus Christ. That, that if Jesus Christ is not, if the yoke of his lordship is not on your life, what do I mean by that? That I accept that he's in control. That I accept that he's leading and I'm following. That I accept that his, that his plan, that his boundaries for my life are pleasant and good and I submit to them. You following me? When I do that, I take upon his lordship and I say, okay, you're leading, I'm following. That opens the door for me to learn from him and receive rest. Could it be that many times our stressed out lives reflect a lack of submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ in certain areas of our lives? As a believer, if I asked you, are you submitted to Christ? You'd say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, no doubt. But if we peeled back some of the layers of how you apply that, how I apply that, I'd go, I don't know if you're actually Lord in this area of my life. And it could be that it's why I'm on edge. It could be that it's why I experience way more stress than I should. It could be that 
that I'm called to do that amount of work or even more, but have much more joy and peace in it and not feel burdened. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So did God call you not to be as productive or more than you are? Of course he called you to be productive. Of course he called you to kill it. Of course he called you to do all, all the things that he called you to do. How do you carry the weight? And are you carrying the right weight? I want you to think about this, and I want the Holy Spirit to start to deal with this. See, Abraham, God's rest isn't just temporary and earthly. It's also supernatural and eternal. Abraham, God brought Abraham to the land of promise. Abraham not only lived in faith, but he died in faith. He lived by faith and he died in faith because while God brought him to the land of promise and gave it to him as an establishment, Abraham actually never received it. Abraham knew that the promise of perfect rest and an everlasting inheritance had its fulfillment in the hereafter, not now. Hear me. He perceived that by faith, the earthly territory that God wanted to give him pointed to a heavenly one that was far more perfect. Hear me. Get this or you'll think Abraham was a failure. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance... How did he receive it? Through his children. Obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. That sounds a lot to me like a yoke that's easy and a burden that's light. Because Abraham didn't go, God, I need all the things that I'm stressed out about. How are they going to happen? He literally went to a place that the Lord would show him. That's like packing for vacation and saying, I don't know where we're going but I'm getting on the road. I'm getting on the road. My dad's laughing because we literally did that as children. (laughs) One year we were in a van and he said, where do you want to go, Colorado or Florida? Those are two very different places to pack for. So I don't know, maybe he had it rigged, I don't know. Later he said he did, but I don't believe he did. (laughs) Where do you want to go? He said, I got to get on 95 or 64. We're going one way or the other. As a kid, I thought it was pretty cool. We're going to go to a place that the Lord will show you. He went. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. He didn't have it all together. He didn't have everything lined up. For he was looking for a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. He wasn't looking, listen, he was looking for a heavenly country, not an earthly one. He he could rest because his perspective was right. The yoke was easy and the burden was light. But the rest wasn't just earthly and temporal. God's rest is eternal and supernatural. It's why God said to Israel, rest also comes by faith. You can't rest in God if you don't have faith that he's in control. And let's be honest, if I took an honest poll, some of us would not say that. And you go, I would never, I mean, of course he's in control. We don't live our lives like it. I hope you come back next week. (laughs) Think about it. Israel, God took them all the way to the promised land, the fulfillment of what God had promised Abraham. That generation looked at all the problems that the promised land had, because your promise is not devoid of problems. If you want to think about rest, know this, that the promise of God for your life is not devoid of problems. There are things to be conquered. There's territory to be taken. They saw giants in the land. They saw cities that were fortified. They saw big armies, and they said, heck to the no. God can't do that. He's not big enough. 
They didn't have faith. So God said, you know what? I'm going to fulfill for you everything that you spoke. That's why it's better not to speak than to speak the wrong thing. Because if God fulfills nothing, that's better than... Here's, you know what God said? He said, I'll fulfill all that you've spoken. In the desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who were counted in the census and grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hands to make your home. Come on. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, they're going to inherit it, but they're going to suffer for your lack of faith. They'll wander for 40 years. The promise of God will be delayed for your children. Aren't you glad that God didn't punish their children entirely and keep them out of the promise? God still had a promise for their kids. And guess what? God still has a promise for yours, even though a lot of us have made some dumb decisions. Doesn't mean they don't pay for it, but it does mean that they can get over it. Are you with me? Man, that, that's a whole nother message. But it says, I'll fulfill all that, all that you spoke. Church, faith speaks, but so does doubt. And resting is about knowing. That's why, that's why God said, they will never enter my rest. Rest is not just a place, it's a promise. It's not just a state of being, it's a place that you find in God. It's his, it's his provision, it's his purpose for your life. When you're living in the purpose of God, there's rest in it. There's rest in it. There's not only joy in it, there's rest in it. There's, there's peace in it. So, so why would God speak about inheriting the promise is, is entering his rest? Entering the promised land is entering his rest because God knows that when you're walking in alignment with his purpose, even doing the work of taking care of the promised land, that you can have joy and peace and rest in it, that you actually can be rejuvenated by doing the work of the Lord. Are we getting this today? We're getting it here, not just here. God, God's rest, and this is going to be hard for you, it's hard for me. I want you to hear it though. God's rest comes through surrender. Oh. Pastor John, then go back on vacation. <laughs> Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Church, he makes you. Sometimes God has to make you. Should we camp out there for a minute? Sometimes God has to make you. I hope he doesn't have to make you from adrenal fatigue or burnout or whatever else or through, through rough patches in your marriage or other things. I hope that he makes you by saying, here's a spot, and you go, yes, sir, I'll take that. Because if he's really got to make you, he'll find a way to make you. We've all been there. Green pastures. So he knows what I need the right nutrients for my life. Sometimes we have problems with diet. I'm not talking about physical stuff. We all got that. About what we include in our life. God knows what to include in your life. Some of your schedules are out of balance in diet. And that comes through wrong priorities, wrong values, wrong beliefs. So stop trying to feed yourselves. God knows what you need and is far better at giving it to you than you are. Quiet waters. I suffer from an ear injury. Um, it took about 20 years to repair it. They didn't have the technology to do it when I injured it. Um, but I've lost hearing in it. Some. So my left ear, if you're on my left side and you're talking to me, sometimes I'll nod at you and smile, but I have absolutely no clue what you just said. <laughs> 
particularly in a loud environment. Now, if we're just talking, I can hear just about everything. Amy would disagree with you. She says, I, I don't hear a lot of what she says, but I tell her I have an ear injury, and she goes, yeah, right. But, but if things are loud, there's a lot of ambient noise in the room. It's hard for me to discern your voice in this ear. I think that that's a lesson, not just for me, but for you. Sometimes the noise in your life is too loud for even a well-trained ear to hear God's voice. Way too much going on. So the Bible says he leads you beside quiet waters. There's a rumble, but it's real small. Right? There's things going on, but it's not louder than him. You can hear him, you can hear him easily. So it doesn't just speak to refreshing. It speaks to the atmosphere of your life. What's loud? What isn't? What gets your attention? What doesn't? Quiet. There are times, if I can just help you, I don't have it with me. But that, that device, it's about that big. Put that down. Put it down a little bit. I'm letting you know this is a level of hypocrisy for me because I... I'm always texting and calling and doing and emailing and all those things. Put it down for a minute and let the voice of God speak in your life. You'll be surprised what busyness, how loud busyness gets. But the Bible says he leads you. I can never end up where God wants me if I don't allow him to lead. Dress. Amy and I have this joke in our family because Amy suffers from, I think, what, what's known as de decision fatigue. She never wants to make the wrong decision, so she doesn't make any decision. Does anybody else suffer from this? <laughs> All the women raise their hands. By the way, my wife has far better qualities than we, me and way more of them. So she's, she's, she's going to be preaching soon, so I'm going to be gentle on this because I'll get it back. <laughs> but I say this to say, uh, so I'll say, Amy, just make a decision. It's a paralysis of analysis. At a certain point, you've got to go. You've got to move. But there's decision fatigue. Do you realize that you can experience a lot of unrest by being stressed out by a decision? When God leads you, you don't got to worry about that. You go, well, I mean, if I, yeah, but, but I, no, 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 no. That sounds cliche. If you know how to hear him, well, I don't hear, I mean, God doesn't speak to me. Too loud. Too loud. God's speaking to you. Dollars to donuts. He's speaking. We can't bet. But dollars to donuts. He's speaking to you. <laughs> what does that mean? If you're having a hard time hearing him, let him take you to quiet waters. It'll, it'll release you from decision fatigue. You're able to go, no, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. Walk in it. There's been very few decisions in leading the church for 10 years that God didn't already make abundantly clear long before I got there. Very few. Most of them, leaders in this church, our board, our staff, myself, we all could see what God was doing because if I was off, I had people to go, let's, let's, let's listen. Pastor, you're working too much. Hear the voice of the Lord. Yeah, that's where he's leading. There's an open door there. Duh. We should, of course, lead in faith. One of the biggest decisions that we had to make is when we all 
thought like, what's going to happen with the world when COVID hit in March of 2020? We're in the middle of building this building. We're about to. We've already done a campaign. We've already done the things. And I was like, oh, Lord, we taking people's money. We're not going to be able to build nothing. COVID just happened. And I remember just feeling such peace. Our board feeling such peace. They said, you know, we should lean in in faith. I know nobody's doing anything, but we should talk with a builder and we should, we should go ahead and proceed. And I was like, should we? Yeah, I think that's the right thing too. And we did. We signed a contract. There's so much equity in that building. I mean, we, we, we got a contract we could never get because all the construction companies thought the world was ending. And they're like, well, I mean, we'll build it for free. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just want to keep people working, you know? And so, so we did. And church, I'm telling you right now, we saved so much money on that building. You have no idea. At the end of that project, our foreman came to me and just said, we're so happy to get off this job. We've lost, because then the economy supercharged because of inflation and they were losing so much money being on our job because they couldn't be on somebody else's job because they couldn't chart, they had to honor our prices. I said, you've got so much equity in this building. And I just smiled. I said, I know. <laughs> God always knows which way to go. He's never been confused. Listen to me. I know you know this, but I want you to know this. He's never been confused. And he's always ordered your steps. He wrote out every day. You can rest in his sovereignty. You can rest in his character. You can rest in his promise. You can rest in his presence. You can rest. Rest is not always the absence of work. It's taking and managing a weight. It's knowing the weight to carry and being content in carrying it. I got through three pages, I got 10. So I'm gonna end with this. There's a lot I wanna talk about. I will finish this. Just not today. David said, King David, you have caused my boundary lines to fall in pleasant places. You've allotted my portion and my cup. No striving. You don't have to strive for what God already promised to give you. You do have to receive it by faith and protect it through prayer. Receive it by faith and protect it through prayer. But you do not have to strive for it. God promised it to you. It's your portion as his child. You can rest. Rest is not sleeping in on Sunday. Rest is being in the presence of God. Just being real. Rest is not self-soothing with substances, images, or things that shouldn't be a part of your life. Is everybody hearing me today? Rest is not talking to that person online. Rest is not looking at some, something outside of your marriage. Rest is not, see, that's self-soothing. Rest is submitting to God's call and His plan for your life, which is always good, always good. Are you hearing me today? Rest with the best. He is the best. He leads. He guides. He restores your soul. Your soul, by the way, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Things that I've seen Afraid the last three years. Your emotions. 
So emotional. He restores your emotions, your mind, your will. The Bible says it is God who wills and acts in you according to his good purpose. He restores your will. It's he who began a good work in you that will be faithful to complete it. Your mind. But we have the mind of Christ. Are you with me? The definition of restore is to put again in possession of something. That God restores. He, he puts your mind, your will, and your emotions back into his possession. Says, oh, you're off. Oh, it's wrong. To, to bring back to a place to renew. Let God renew you today. He guides. Have you noticed that in Psalm 23, God is doing all the work? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one. He does what? Leads me beside green pastures, still waters. He leads. He guides. He restores. Right? He does it all. He makes. Is God actually doing all the work and rest? You're just participating with him. And you're following him. I hope this is okay. I felt like our church needs this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it at some point, but I want you to hear this. In resting, this church will produce 10 times what it could in striving. You will. So God's giving you a cheat code today. Use it. Submit yourself. Connection. Devotions, church. Reading and praying. Reading, praying, worshiping. I'll talk about these in a couple weeks, but I want you to hear this. Connection. Submit your life to God's will. Stop chasing after what the world's offering you. Say, Lord, you've caused my lines to fall in pleasant places. There's a lot to this. But it's a start today. Would you bow your heads with me? One of the definitions for rest is presence. It's being in the presence of God. Maybe you're here today and you are far from his presence. I want our prayer team to come and I just believe there are people that are supposed to be set free today. Man, you're on edge. You're striving. It's just like white knuckling it. Just too many things. God wants to give you rest. He wants to give you freedom. I think this message is for a whole church. But there's also people here today who have not encountered his presence. So you don't really know what rest looks like. You think it's a vacation. It's not. That can be a part of it. Sure. Time. Freedom from work. That's part of it. But there's this rest part, which is the presence of God. And if you don't know the presence of God, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your shepherd, the one who makes, leads, restores, guides, I want to invite you today into a relationship with Jesus where sin is forgiven, where heaven is assured, where abundant life is offered. And where he's leading and you're following. Where surrender happens. Rest cannot happen without surrender. So if you want rest for your weary souls, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. How we come to him is by faith through confession. So today we're going to pray. And I want to invite you to give your life to God. I want to give you, uh, invite you to Start a relationship with Jesus. I want to invite you to repent of sin. It's evil. It's nasty. We all have it. It condemns us to hell. But today you can find life in him. I want our whole church to help people today meet Jesus. We do that by saying a prayer. If you're online or here, you can do that. And at the end of that, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Say, dear God, forgive me of my sin. I turn from it and I turn to you. 
Jesus, I follow you. I make you my shepherd. I make you my Lord and Savior. I thank you that you paid a price I couldn't when you went to the cross. When you rose again, you gave me abundant and eternal life. I receive it now. I enter into your rest. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you said that prayer a minute in your heart right now, let me celebrate with you as you raise your hand. Come on, raise them nice.